Hello and welcome to a, another episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we get into this week's episode, I want to let you guys know that if you would like to support Fork Full of Noodles and DIY socially conscious comedy content, you can donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Everything starts at only $2 a month, so go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha to find out all the details, the different tiers, the rewards, and the goals of what you'd be supporting. All right, now let's dive into this week's episode. Just this past August, North America saw one of the largest prison strikes. And no, that's not that all prisons went on strikes and weren't taking any more inmates, which would cause mass pandemonium across the populace, right? If prisons weren't taking any more inmates, the so-called civilized would go nuts, right? Breaking every law that they could. I mean, dudes would be at every street corner masturbating and laughing maniacally. Basic bitches would be looting every single mall that they could find. Alcoholics would be putting their filthy mouths right up to the tap at every single bar. And I'm not saying that alcoholics are the only one with filthy mouths. Okay, mouths in general are, are just gross. Okay, so settle down, you sensitive pricks out there. All right, I have alcoholic friends, so I can make a joke like that. Hell, I'd, I'd break a few laws, right? I, I would just park where I want, when I want, right? What's that? Princess parking? Right on the sidewalk? Don't mind if I do. And then I would tell every single parking authority employee to go fuck themselves and that you can't really own parking spots, man. This is the people's parking spot now. Huh? And then I would spray paint the anarchist A right on the parking authority person's shirt. Okay, so now that we've fantasized on the lack of self-control we'd have without the fear of a prison system and how eerily close to a small-scale imperial manifest destiny it'd be, let's get back to the strike, right? This 19-day strike was organized by prisoners with the help of jailhouse lawyer speak with a list of 10 demands. So let's take a look. So the first one is pretty simple, right? The conditions of prisons should be humane. Yeah. So prisoners knew this could happen anywhere and this is unsafe and we need people to know that the conditions are like this. We saw just last month, 15 prisoners died in Mississippi. Someone lost their life every other day that month due to conditions in the prisons. And it shouldn't be that way. When someone's sentenced to incarceration, they should be able to safely serve their time and have access to the resources that they need to become a better person, to become the, be the person that they want to be. After all, isn't that the point of prison to help someone that's committed a crime find their humanity back, rehabilitate them back into society? Right? If the condition of their removal from society isn't something that you would want, then how could we expect them to function well when they get out of that system? Prisons are often built next to sludge pools that contaminate their food and water supply. Look, I get it, right? Cafeteria food isn't supposed to be all that great, but I don't think it's supposed to be like actual sludge. It's, it's just supposed to look like it. Look, and I went to public school, which some of us thought was like a prison, right? Instead of gangs, you just had cliques. You had the, the cheerleaders, the, the jocks, the burnouts, the kids that like to dress up like their anime characters every day. You know, I mean, these were little cliques that were gangs that would have their own initiation ceremonies. But if you actually served high school kids real sludge, the, the gangs would unite, right? The, the cheerleaders would be creating an environmental disaster with how much they'd be puking everywhere. The jocks would be running plays to get to every vending machine and the primo shit that's in the teacher's lounge. And the anime kid nerds would be kamehameha-ing you to kingdom come, okay? The plus side is that the prisoners are probably a little bit more mature than high schoolers. So they decided to go on strike, being treated like the sludge that they are fed. And not only is the food and water toxic, so is their environment. 
Right? In, in Florida and Pennsylvania prisons, there was an outbreak of hepatitis C that wasn't taken care of. And Florida particularly hired an outside contractor, and that contractor refused to service some of the inmates. And the Department of Corrections didn't do anything about this. Okay, look, Florida, just because you're shaped like a floppy dong doesn't mean that you have to act like an overcompensating dick. And in terms of mental health, being put in solitary confinement can break a person's psyche. The UN considers that torture, but then again, when has America ever considered what the UN has to say? Right? Solitary confinement only teaches you how to be in a cubicle staring at a gray wall in front of you every single day as you slowly forget the concept of time and become one with a spreadsheet. Okay, so there's no spreadsheets in solitary confinement in prisons, not yet anyway, but you wouldn't want any blatant evidence of the corporatocracy. And the conditions of the prison is what sparked these strikers to mobilize, right? The strike wasn't supposed to happen until 2019, but a riot in the Lee Correctional Facility in South Carolina that left seven inmates dead and even more injured prompted these strikers to move forward. They called this strike and they wanted it to happen for next year. But after the violent massacre happened in Lee County, where prison officials took away prisoners' lockers and they switched up room assignments, they made really volatile and violent conditions for prisoners. Prisoners knew we have to do this right now. This could happen in any prison in the United States. It's so unstable and unsafe in our prisons that this is the littlest thing. And it's not a little thing when lockers are taken away, but on the outside, we kind of see it as a little thing. They and the riot happened after access to the inmates' lockers were taken away, uh, swapping of cellmates, and kind of poking and prodding at the politics of prison dynamics. And the guards didn't do much, uh, and they let it escalate before even getting involved. So the conditions of our current prisons don't help these people rehabilitate, but wind them up so tight that they burst, right? From less than poor living conditions to losing what little you have and constantly being pro poked and prodded, this system does little to ensure that inmates are ready to handle society when they get out. Right? Hell, they are barely ready to handle middle school by the end of it. And I doubt that these burnouts would want to hang out with these inmates in this condition. And that, and that is a damn shame because I bet these inmates know exactly where to get some really great weed. The second is a big one. End prison slavery. And a lot of movement has been happening with the man number two, majorly because it has been getting the most uh, press attention and media attention, and people are being more conscious about the fact that they're supporting prison labor. When they go to establishments like McDonald's and Walmart and, and different places that exploit prisoners' labor, we have to understand that these lower prices are due to the fact that, that a huge part of their employment base isn't being paid what they need to support themselves. I mean, prisoners are paid next to nothing for their labor. And this is also a major demand from the Operation Push movement. Right Back in January, there was a 30-day prison strike in Florida, and end wage slavery was on the top of their list. Okay, this addresses the fact that items in prison are highly overly inflated in price. A $4 can of soup is $17 in prison. I mean, you would think that these wardens are taking tips from bankers. So the major question I'm sure everybody has is, why should we care that prisoners aren't getting paid anything for their labor, right? These are, these are criminals, deviants, despots, pot smokers, and jaywalkers. Why should we care that they aren't getting paid a decent wage? Well, I'm glad you ask. I'll repeat this again. If the point of prison is meant to rehabilitate, then they should know what it's like to manage a budget and make a decent wage. If you, It's important to know the value of yourself so you can learn the value of another human life.
But then again, that'll mean changing the way we look at our own jobs, right? Perhaps if we knew the value of our work, we'd fight a little harder for the value of labor in prisons. But labor itself is a transformation of slavery, right? CEOs and corporate lords are making 400 times what an employee makes. And in some cases, some of us on the outside are working two to three jobs just to get by. When a society treats its civilians this terribly, it's no surprise that the prison population is given hardly anything for their labor. Organizations like Operation Push and Jailhouse Lawyer Speak advocate for prisoner wage reform so when they leave and re-enter society, they can afford a way to get back on their feet instead of a system telling them to sink or swim. Right? And at the current moment, that's what the system says, and this causes more recidivism. That's when ex-felons commit a crime again that puts them back in prison. I mean, that's what the system says about the when it comes to the job market too, right? I mean, the competitive edge to make sure you succeed and somebody else fails, right? In some ways, the current prison system is just showing us what the corporate world on the outside has to offer since that's who owns the prisons anyway, right? The only difference between getting a promotion in the corporate world and the prison system is that in the corporate world, it's gained through mentally shiving your opponent instead of physically. In Floridian pr prisons, gain time is practice. This is where prisoners work to decrease time off their sentence. That doesn't sound so bad, but when you realize that it doesn't really help anyone serving longer sentences or even life sentences, it kind of sucks. Right, when you get a few years off, when you have 65 years and no parole on your docket, what difference does it make? Right, it's like being stuck in a classroom on the first day of summer and your teacher's like, we're getting out two minutes early. It doesn't matter. It still feels like it's cruel and time has completely come to a standstill. If we paid prisoners a decent wage, then they could buy what they needed to to live comfortably. And if need be, send some money home. That's right. Even though they're serving time, some inmates would jump at the opportunity to help their family. And that's how bad this income disparity has gotten. That even though there are people working two, three jobs, they might still need income from an inmate to be stable. Labor is just transformed slavery. And this is one of the major things the strikes achieve, right? After this was revealed, people don't want to see prisoners being exploited and diminished for their work. The strikes started the conversation for the end of prison slavery. The movement has been happening on demand number two, especially. And that's really with the people. It all starts with the people making the decision, okay, we, we don't want to see prisoners exploited, so I'm no longer going to support this establishment until I see that they are paying prisoners fair wages. Prisoners want to have jobs. They want to be able to get out of their cell and move their bodies and do work that's valuable, but they don't want to be underpaid for it. Just because they're serving time doesn't mean that, they're, that their time shouldn't be well spent, that their time shouldn't, shouldn't um, have value, that they shouldn't have value in what they're doing. The strike also asked for ensuring legal services to inmates, stop the denial of rehabilitation program, and restoring the right for prisoners to vote. Once again, if the point is to rehabilitate, then you should be able to do what everybody else gets to do once you get out of prison. So their voices should count in a world that they are reintroduced to. If not, then the cycle will just repeat itself and increase recidivism. The current system is not about rehabilitation. It's part of the reason why that was even on the list of demands. The current system is about profit, right? The, the prisons are run and owned by corporate sugar daddies and they don't get their allowance unless those cells and beds are filled. Recidivism is what they rely on. It's their bread and butter. They can't keep inventing new crimes to put people in prison for. And with the rate 
that marijuana is getting legalized in this country. They can't keep using that as a boogeyman. So they have to go with the long con and pardon the pun there and psychologically attack the inmates to ensure that they either come back to the system or stay in it. It's like they want people to be addicted to prisons. And look, I don't think our society can handle a prison epidemic right now. And I know some of you out there are saying, well, Krish, this was weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Why talk about it now? I mean, the news cycle is over. We all know prisons are bad now. Well, that's not good enough, right? No, I don't want people to just forget about this issue. Just because it's over in the news cycle doesn't mean that the prison industrial complex is. So consider this bringing it back into the news cycle. The main point of the strike is to make sure that inmates regain their humanity. And forgetting the strikes is forgetting that. So this should be on everybody's lips, right? Ex-felons and ex-cons should be treated with the same dignity as everyone else. That's the first step to changing this broken system. Dostoevsky said the degree of civilization in society can be judged by entering its prisons. We should have better prisons. If there was prison reform, maybe we'd get to a point where there was less and less crime. Then when we outgrow a need for a prison, maybe we can ask the man who's on the side of the street masturbating furiously to put his dick away. And... We can finally park in logical areas of the streets without the fear of oppression of rent-a-cops that think that they are the law. It will be the people's parking. And as we keep moving forward, after the prison strike of 2018, people must be wondering, would reforming the system actually work? Right? After all, aren't these scary criminals? Right? Why would we want these mustache-twirling doomsters out of their concrete boxes? The strike was meant to show that these people can be better human beings. And with thoughts like that mixed in with the degradation of good lifestyle condition, it only proves that they are pushed into more violent and unstable conditions. And therein lies the problem with real prison reform, the way we look at inmates and ex-felons. As I mentioned earlier, we should be looking them as fellow human beings. And a lot of them want to redeem themselves in the eyes of society. But in the eyes of society, they will, are always some kind of subhuman monster that wants to end the world. And we have to change that perspective. Just because justice is blind doesn't mean that we have to be. Now, there are several places that have acted on the principles of the 2018 prison strike. And all right, we are to, gonna start in the United States just to be fair. Yes, the country that hypocritically claims that we have unlimited freedoms like AT&T claims you get unlimited data but has the largest prison population like AT&T has the largest amount of contractual fuck yous. And I am starting here in the States because now people can't sit and claim that I hate America. You know, I, I don't hate America. I just want America to stop hating itself. Okay, America sold itself to corporate power and the whims of the elites, forgetting how the working class and immigrants really built this place. Oh, and slaves. And slaves. Right? I mean, what makes America America is being stomped on and oppressed by itself. I just want America to see that it can be better than an oligarchical corporate shit show. Now that we got that disclaimer out of the way, let's talk about the PACT program that's being implemented in Massachusetts. The People Achieving Change Together program's main goal is teaching responsibility and breaking the cycle, right? This might be the first time that something has tried that hasn't been an initiative of profit. And if responsibility is the main goal of this program, maybe we can put the CEOs of some war profiteering companies in there. You know, teach Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and General Dynamics that they too can shoulder the blame of an exploitative war machine and maybe they should stop funding it. 
by which I mean themselves. They, they should stop themselves. You know, they could shut down their companies and help rebuild the countries that they've destroyed. PACT operates as a separate unit where jail politics don't exist and the inmates can be off guard. So things that we've seen in shows like Oz and Oz the Next Generation doesn't happen. In the separate unit, they can go to therapy and mandated uh, anger management, and they also have a consistent schedule of work and classes. And this is all to help them re-enter society as functional adults. Kind of feel like what this, this is what school should be. And the point is, this will decrease recidivism and help at-risk youth. But some people, like Bristol County Sheriff Thomas Hodson, claim that we should focus on decreasing at-risk youths in general at the start of all of this, instead of pushing experimental programs that restore compassion and empathy. But unfortunately, Sheriff Hodson wouldn't like to decrease the amount of nonviolent crimes that are prisonable offenses like smoking or even knowing what marijuana is. Oh, or, or when cops stop looking at these at-risk youths as the enemy. Or we can decrease the racial barrier between cops and the communities they're supposed to protect and serve instead of harass and separate maybe we wouldn't have so many people at risk. What we are at risk from is the law. Maybe more of America would be able to adopt these experimental practices if people weren't so constantly worried about being number one in everything. I mean, we are competing over excellence in slavery and giving our citizens permanent PTSD. Okay, let's all agree right now that if you are a country that uses slave labor of any kind, you don't even get a participation trophy, okay? Until they decide that they're going to give these people a fair, livable wage in their factories and their prisons, they don't even get a gold star by their name. In Germany, there is a large focus in two aspects for prison. The first is architectural safety. They want to make sure the environment is safe for the prisoners instead of one where they get an infection and are ignored by the guards, right? They want to create an environment where dropping the soap doesn't just prevent possible prison rapes, but also diseases contracted from a dirty prison shower, right? They, the point is they want to make a, a more comfortable environment for prisoners to focus on rehabilitation rather than Andy Dufresne themselves out of prison. The second thing German prisons focus on is relational safety. They are encouraged to make friends and form bonds, not gangs. That way a, a culture of fear isn't bred in prisons. And freedom from fear can lead to more compassion and empathy in a person. And again, it helps in the rehabilitation aspect of prison reform. And we can totally use these in American prisons, right? If we can't curb violence, from the guards towards the inmates, right? We can just put these puffy gym mats on the wall so when the guards push the inmates against them, they'll just bounce off and come and they, and they land a hug right on that guard, right? That, that shows the guards that they don't need to fear the inmates, right? And even if their dad didn't love them, maybe this reforming murderer does. I feel like this is way better than orange is the new black, right? Compassion is the new orange. Let's head over to Brazil, which has the fourth largest prison population in the world. I mean, they don't even get a trophy for that. Maybe that's why they have such a radical uh, prison reform idea. You know, the Association for the Protection and Assistance to Convicts, or the APAC program, is a prisoner-run incarceration program. It is a prison run by inmates for inmates. APAC doesn't look at prisoners as inmates, right? They call them recuperandos or recovering people. There are three levels to this pr these prisons. A closed section where there's a sign above that reads, the man enters and the crime stays out. And this is where people that have committed the most heinous of crimes are kept in a calm environment. 
The phrase above ensures that you have an opportunity to not be defined by your misgivings. The semi-open section includes things like running a storeroom or an office, and an open section involves jobs like guarding the door. That's right. Prisoners guard their own doors, and none of them want to escape. Right? They want to stay there and serve their time to show their remorse and better themselves as individuals within a community. It's like uh, being an RA at a college, right? But, but at the end of this, you actually get to learn something instead of just hunting down freshmen that are trying to get their dicks wet. With the environment that they're in, they can focus on returning home to their families and pursuing their passions outside prison, right? Plus... If they do escape, they lose the opportunity to be a part of the APAC system. A sign of remorse is a major quality to be transferred out of the, the violent, unstable prison system where, where to, to one where, where you get to see a light at the end of the tunnel because you're actually allowed to hang out in the light. In this system, no one should be in their cells unless they are sick or yes, faking sick, right? Because this is so close to the outside, people and people call off sick on the outside all the time, I'm sure it's known to happen. Okay, but, but in, in this situation, they're not really at home playing Xbox in their underwear. They're, they're still in some kind of a prison. So I am sure that these prisoners actually have a better attendance record and discipline than most free people. They all have a regimented schedule of work, chores, and extracurriculars, right? They, they sweep the streets, they run the stores, they make labels for the soaps that are made in prison itself, which I am assuming have to have better grips. They have to come with like a better gripping system that they've made in prison right and, and they do so much more they get to re-engage with the community right they get to give back they get to have a sense of purpose and responsibility this creates less recidivism and some even want to be a part of the apac system itself the first thing they do when they get to the apac is go to the woodworking shop and they work on something with their hands right the idea is that they destroyed something, so now they have to create something to begin their process of redemption. This instills the fact that they are still human beings, and much like the sign above the closed area, they won't be defined by their crime. Overcrowding isn't an issue because they only take in about 200 people per APAC, and this program has had so much success that it is spread over to Ecuador and Chile. And it's hard to get you know, a, a program like this together everywhere because it takes a lot of political will and state involvement. So the people have to be on board with the system to begin with. And then a system has to be less about profit and more about helping people. And we can totally adopt a system like this in the states i mean maybe if we adopted a system like this here in the states then then bankers wouldn't be so scared to go to prison and they would learn that fucking over the middle class using predatory lending practices isn't right right instead of justifying their actions and looking for corrupt politicians to bail them out in fear of gang shivings and dropping the soap they would just ask for forgiveness and serve their time Right? And the same can go for violent cops, warmongers, domestic abusers, and anyone that actually wants to redeem themselves in the eyes of people and their communities. Now, I'm sure there are some of you that are out there that are, that are saying that, it, you know, if, if prisons are actually comfortable, then what's the point of punishment, right? Well, the harsh environment, Krish, is what they need to know that they are punished. Actually, the fact that they're away from their families, communities, and loved ones is the punishment. The rest of prison is meant to help them re-enter society, not just be locked up in a box for the purposes of a CEO somewhere that needs to light a cigar with a $100 bill. Aside from the PACT program, there isn't any sort of large-scale prison reform happening in America. And, and, and that part of that comes from the dehumanization of prisoners in the eyes of society. And we need to treat these folks better. 
We need to be better in our society. They've asked for redemption and we can give it to them, right? In programs like the APAC, Germany's prison system, and even the PACT program help people find their second chance. They are working to break the cycle. So why not let them have a real second chance? Another aspect of the prison strike of 2018 is giving the people an opportunity to show that they can better themselves and get out of jail early. But that means working within the legal system. And the confines of that are not particularly easy to navigate, right? If it were, law school would be a breeze and courtroom dramas would be boring as sin. I mean, Ice-T wouldn't have a career if, if laws were written for the citizens, right? He would just have like a, a lucrative rap career. I mean, most people don't even trust lawyers, right? Most people think lawyers are liars, and some of these people include family. My grandmother, 20 years ago, that I wanted to go to law school. Grandma didn't pause. She didn't skip a beat. She said to me, lawyer is liar. <laughs> That was discouraging. <laughs> right, if you are encouraged to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on a degree that makes you a professional liar, then we should probably rethink the whole fucking system, right? I mean, Ice-T would be so mad if he has to work with these lying snitches all the time, even, even if it's fictional, right? Have, have these lawyers considered Ice-T's feelings? Because that's neither lawful nor order full but there might actually be one company that cares about ice tea's feelings though he might be a little bit lower on their you know agendas list there but the company company called Namathy is trying to put the law back into the hands of people using the idea of barefoot lawyers all right everyone just settle settle down all right these aren't actually barefooted lawyers. I'm pretty sure a lot of courtrooms have a no shirts, no shoes, no litigation policy. All right, It's the only law that is applicable whether you're rich or poor. But this is one of the principles that Namathy works off of, that there are two justice systems, one for the poor and one for the rich. Law is supposed to be the language we use to translate our dreams about justice into living institutions that hold us together. Law is supposed to be the difference between a society ruled by the most powerful and one that honors the dignity of everyone, strong or weak. Now, this shouldn't come as a surprise to most Americans, right? That's kind of what this country was built on. Then it was covered up using racism as a decoy, right? Poor whites. Uh, who, whose rights are being stomped on are now attacking poor minorities who are having the same rights stomped on. According to Vivek Maru, the CEO of Namathy, the law should be accessible to everyone and we should all be able to understand it. For many of the problems people face, worse, our profession has shrouded law in a cloak of complexity. Laws like riot gear, on a police officer. It's intimidating and impenetrable, and it's hard to tell there's something human underneath. If we're going to make justice a reality for everyone, we need to turn law from an abstraction or a threat into something that every single person can understand, use, and shape. Right, look. Most of these laws are written in English, which is a language that most English-speaking countries don't have a grasp of. And to make matters worse, the frivolous use of words like thee and thou and even furthermore confuses regular people. And these documents are hundreds of pages long. Most of us can't even get through a pamphlet, let alone a legal document. I mean, maybe some of these laws should be written in cartoon form because this is neither accessible nor understandable the way it is. As a side note, I have to say, I am very excited to find an, another Indian person in the States that doesn't suck. 
right? With the spotlight on people like Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley and Ajit Pai who are actively ruining America and my soul, it is just nice to see someone that shares progressive values like Kasham Savant and Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, it, it really warms my heart. Maybe now I'll stop getting compared to Aziz Ansari. Anyway, uh, Namathi uses the idea of community paralegals or barefoot lawyers to help people navigate the world of law and understand it. That means that they put it in, into simple terms. They break it down. And, and in a lot of cases, it's in non-English speaking languages. <laughs> The paralegals explain land law in simple terms and they help farmers to secure rights over land they do have and recover land that has been taken. Yes. There are other languages in the world. Yes, they are just as grammatically fucked up. And no, I will not teach you to curse in my language. These lawyers go into communities where large corporations or entities have taken advantage of people and teach them the existence of certain laws and how to use administrative tools as a means to win. And this is huge because in a lot of these communities, injustice is the norm. There are almost always laws on the books that would protect these people, but they've often never heard of those laws. And the systems that are supposed to enforce those laws are corrupt or broken or both. So this gives people a beacon of hope. And this really should be used in America a lot more since this is an entire country run by corporations. This grassroots effort teaches people how to utilize and uh, health, environmental, citizenship, and land laws. Okay, th this has helped communities that where farmers were offered little to no money by a corporation that took their land or, or communities that didn't know how to battle health insurance companies or, or communities whose land, air, and water has been poisoned by factories at their doorstep. Now, Namathi doesn't win all its cases, but they will do their best to help people get the justice they deserve. As Vivek Maru puts it, in these sort of cases, hope and despair are neck and neck. Whether it's India, Kenya, the United States, or anywhere else, trying to squeeze justice out of broken systems is like Ravi's case. Hope and despair are neck and neck. And this is a huge issue because the UN estimates about 4 billion people don't have access to basic justice. The UN estimates that worldwide 4 billion people live without basic access to justice. These people face grave threats to their safety, their livelihoods, their dignity. So that means half the world, right? Half the world is just being oppressed by the 1% elites and the other 49% are doing their dirty work because, well, the elites haven't seen dirt since the early 1800s, but, but, but they do want to own the rights to dirt. This concept of basic justice comes from the idea of doing what's logical, ethical, and is going to keep us alive as a species. It should be the way the legal system works. If we all just get to a point where we realize that exploiting each other for profits, poisoning not just the planet, but each other, just to hoard wealth was immoral and counterproductive to our basic survival, we probably wouldn't need laws written in the books. They would just kind of be like these fucking duh moments. You know, redemption would get a lot easier. But since that's not the case, we need more programs like this to reinforce the idea that laws were written to hold up ethical and logical decisions and not profits. The work of paralegals is overlooked most of the time, but it's probably the most crucial. We're surrounded by a world that looks at we the people as guilty before proven innocence. But paralegals using grassroots efforts are working together to help us understand a system that wasn't written for us.
It's helping us fight back and put this world back in the hands of the people that built it rather than those that are exploiting it. I feel like Ice-T would be happy to take a break from the courtroom dramas and let Vivek Maru solve a few cases for the sake of real law and order. We have delved into what it takes to make prison a better place that is focused on rehabilitation, reforming the laws, and rehumanizing inmates. But that's only half the issue in this case. Look, if we make the conditions of prisons better but don't actually treat citizens with some respect or kindness in the eyes of the law, then we're starting to cycle all over again. So the question is, can we reform the officers of the law? So before we dive into this, we have to ask, can cops even be reformed, right? Can big beefy dudes who uh, seem to be looking for all the wrong reasons to get into a Wild Wild West style shootout to gain some some badge of honor and, and some coolness points, uh, can, can they be reformed to protect and serve? Well, the example that we can look at here is Captain Ray Lewis. Captain Ray Lewis is a former Philadelphia brutal cop turned Occupy supporter. Okay, first I want to make clear that I am a retired Philadelphia police captain. I'm no longer active. And I first came to uh, align myself with the Occupy movement back in uh, November 2011, shortly after it started, when I read on the, on the newscast that these people were shouting, yelling, and screaming, and that they had a camp in New York City. And that intrigued me. Why are all these people sleeping out in these blue tarps and living like this? And so uh, after a lot of search on the internet, because mainstream media did not have it, the internet, I found a link to the Declaration of the Occupation. It was beautifully written, very descriptive. There were 23 bullet points, and after reading each one, I agreed with it wholeheartedly. There was not a single one that I took issue with. According to Captain Ray Lewis, he saw what the job itself would do to a person. Right, the job of being a cop will harden you since all you do is deal with the shitty things society has to offer. So, a police brutality. I was a brutal cop. And I, I have to let people know that the occupation is such that it hardens you very quickly. I was a ghetto cop 19 to 24 years. My first 10 years were patrol officer in the ghetto. I started out as a real nice, sensitive, caring guy. I was beating people within a year, year and a half. Uh, it breeds that because every day, and I was a sensitive guy. Can you imagine what an insensitive guy getting a job would do? How fast? Every day you run into hostility. Every day you're confronting people who are angry with you. You have to arrest them. So they're, they're upset. They're going to fight you. They spit at you. Every police department has this saying, by the way. There are two types of citizens, two types of people, cops and assholes. That, become, that comes about because that's all cops deal with. They lose sense of the real world. In the ghetto. In the ghetto. I have to make that distinction. After the eighth drunk guy pees on you, your head is going to equate that everyone wants to pee on you. But you can counter this point very easily with something that Jeff Sessions said recently about pulling away from investigating police officers in regards to perjury. Sessions claims that we shouldn't condemn law enforcement because of the actions of a few rotten apples. Great. Can uh, law enforcement make that distinction with citizens that they should be protecting? At current, citizens and law enforcement are fed the narrative that there are only a few bad apples. And I'm sure that there are a lot more Captain Ray Lewis's in the force, but usually they're pushed out, right? Even Captain Ray Lewis got threats from the Philly Commissioner's Office that they will take any actions necessary to stop him from going to the Occupy movement. They can't do anything to a retired officer, although they tried with me. They tried to take my pension. And the police commissioner, then Charles Ramsey, sent me a very threatening letter that I still have, threatening to take any and all necessary action to stop me. So there were threats, even though I had was legally right to do what I did. As it sounds like somebody's getting desperate that their dirty little secrets will take away their position of power. 
Look, people would be a lot quieter if the act if this was the actions of a few rotten apples, right? But the problem is that the rot is spreading, and apparently it spreads so deep that it's decomposing the Department of Justice. Besides, you should be looking at how bad the rot is, right? It's the quality of the rot, not the quantity. You know, eating one bad apple can make people distrust apple trees forever. Unless, of course, the apple tree can help with the decrease of the rotting. But this is the psychology of cops that isn't addressed by the system they serve. The way they, the cops look at the world around them is that it's a constant war for law and order. And according to NYU professor Urban Younger, the cops are fighting a war on two fronts. Crime on the streets and the liberal rule of law. So... To them, reforming and rehabilitating prisoners is putting crime back on the streets because that's how the system they are protecting has educated them. So if the cops are looking at the citizens as their enemy in a war and they're hardened by the job of seeing the worst society has to offer, why not help the cops see a little light in society? Right? A system that is willing to drown its own protectors in PTSD to drive chaos in the streets under the guise of law and order has failed everyone. Not just we the people and the cops, but it's failed itself too. Man, this system is like the epitome of self-hate. You know, some somebody should really get this system some counseling. But this idea uh, that cops would need mandatory mental health counseling based on the job description itself is looked down on, right? According to the president of the Fraternal Order of Police, they suggest a shot and a beer. And subsequently for me, you combat that problem but first by hiring very caring people. But even like I said with me, <laughs> I became brutal. Second, you have to have mandatory counseling. How now, right now, they have counseling. If a, a supervisor sees an officer and he thinks he should go to counseling, he can mandate it. A couple of reasons they don't. Number one, the supervisor wants to be liked. And if that supervisor mandates somebody to counseling, all the other cops know that cop now has a stigma. He had to go. There's something mentally wrong with him. So all the cops think, is my supervisor going to send me for mental counseling? So if you make it... Oh, and by the way, a former president of the Fraternal Order Police, the Philadelphia Union, he said when he was, they were bargaining with the city, the city wanted a counseling program. He said the only, and this is an example that the president of the union said. So all the cops look up to the president of the union, more than the, the police commissioner. He said the only stress program a cop needs is a shot and a mug of beer. What message got a, see that macho image? No cop is going to say, hey, I need help. Right. So if it's mandatory, like every three months, a ghetto cop is mandated to go to counseling, it loses that stigma because all the cops know, well, it's mandated. And what else would you expect from an organization that considers itself a frat house of cops, right? Feeling bad about shooting an innocent black guy on the streets? Pussy, get that keg stand in to drown those feelings. So now we're going to have a bunch of drunk cops looking at uh, looking at their enemies, a.k.a. us, with beer goggles, right? As they're arresting us for uh, something that doesn't deserve a prison sentence, they're going to be asking us out on a date, too. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure that the Me Too movement's head is now going to explode. Captain Ray Lewis also addresses the fact that the test that they have to take at the academy is to blame. In a 500-question test, if they score too high on empathy and compassion, they get rejected. So no goofy, fun-loving cops like the film Police Academy has to offer. No, it's just a bunch of dudes who are eating testosterone for breakfast instead of the donuts they're stereotypically supposed to be. The theory is they won't be able to handle the intensity of the job because their feelings will prevent you from arresting people and corporations won't get to do whatever they want. It is strange that nurses see more gore and blood and semen than cops do, but we want them to be more compassionate and empathetic. So why not cops, right? Unless this is a racially motivated agenda. Okay, I, I mean, when... 
was the last time you heard of a nurse kill someone in the waiting room just because they were black, right? No, no, seriously, I I am asking that question. If if there is a story out there, please please tell me. And before everybody freaks out and claims that I'm saying all cops are racist, I'm not. I'm just saying the system that they are hired to protect is racist. And I know, you know, I think we all know in the recent years there's been an uptick, an increase of police brutality videos of cops shooting innocent people. A lot of them are black people. But that's not to say that white people, natives, Mexicans, all don't get shot by the cops because they do. But the reason why it's a big deal is because there are less black people and Mexicans in America than white people, right? And there's definitely less Native Americans in America than white people. And yes, that is an insane sentence, but history makes it factual. So it's a statistics game. And if we actually encourage cops to get good grades on the policing test, uh, maybe we'd have less of an issue with uh, math and brutality. With all these police shootings in America, I mean, the minority communities are becoming an endangered species here, right? A and if, if this continues, skin color be damned. We're all going to be an endangered species. And then the only ones that'll be left are the elites who will eventually become these half-human, half-dollar bill hybrid creature that sustains itself by eating the concept of exploitation. And this is the legacy of the history of policing in America, right? It was initially introduced as deputized citizens who were part of a slave patrol. Look at the history of policing. I mean, probably the first most modern policing sort of force in America was in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was set up sort of as people might imagine, sort of specifically around the issue of slave insurrection. Some of the first organized patrol police style forces were organized more broadly in the South and in the slave going territories as these so-called slave patrols that were designed to deputize a certain subset of the population to control the movement of slaves. And we see so much of our modern policing system coming out of these models, coming out of this heritage and coming out of this culture. And I think what we've seen sort of from that moment on is that policing is used as an institution of social control in the United States of America. We saw it certainly during slavery. We saw it again during Jim Crow with sort of the juridical uh, empowerment of legal police forces in an apartheid style regime in the South. Uh, we also saw it in the North in many of these same times, even though it was more de facto din de jour, the way the police were used to police the so-called ghettos, the so-called slums to keep black America trapped in tiny little sectors of the major cities or a handful full of tiny little sectors where people were moving into onto what we see today, which is slightly different because it's an institution of social control based not on maintaining a labor force, but based on the reality of so many uh, individuals in the black community having become superfluous population as it were. So this becomes the escalation of that history. Some cops deep down might think that they're still rounding up slaves for their land owning masters. And all of this is, is causing the society and uh, the citizens to lose trust in cops day in and day out. I mean, there's a lot of accounts of cops lying on the stand. New York City police officer Pedro Serrano told the New York Times that the force calls it testa lying, which is also what college boys call it when someone lies about how big their balls are. You, you, you don't want to know how they find out. It, it's... It, it's so gross that nurses are disturbed by it. But this perjury is a result of the encouraged PTSD that cops have to go through when they look at citizens as the enemy and are at constant war with the people, right? The cops that are practicing perjury never outgrew the crying wolf phase of their life, right? Eventually, we're all going to stop believing you. And in fact, a lot of us have. And... The wolf community is really pissed off that these cops are culturally appropriating them. Okay, real cultural appropriation is just the manifest destiny of ideas. And this is a real bummer for lawyers, you know? I mean, they had uh, the, this, this liar thing on lock, you know? I mean, they w got t-shirts. What are they going to do with hundreds and thousands of t-shirts that says lying for laws with a picture of 
of Lady Liberty just snoozing on a futon. Not they can't just give it to third world countries. These aren't Super Bowl t-shirts. So aside from the idea of mandated counseling, which would take the stigma away from people receiving help, there are other more radical ideas on reforming the police. The NEAR Act would change the way policing and violence is looked at on all levels. Right, the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act will put the demands of policing within the communities themselves instead of the cops that need to rebuild some trust. A major change that makes the NEAR Act is a positive way to look at community policing as a viable option is the fact that violence is a public health issue. They use the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement to help folks that might be at risk. The community crime prevention team would find links between behavioral and mental health issues to and address these issues appropriately. In the hands of the community, folks can be protected and served. Now, most of us would say that the cops are supposed to be part of the community, and even if that was true, they're not anymore. You know, the cops that are, are stationed in a neighborhood aren't from there, so they don't know the politics and nuance of those streets, right? To them, they're all strangers uh, that are at risk of falling prey to liberal laws, which are just a gateway to bigger crimes. The NEAR Act looks at the source of police violence as the police themselves, and instead of relying on a system to fix their mistakes, they are taking it upon themselves to look after each other. And this begs the question to be asked, do we even need the police? I would say in the form it's in now, no. I mean, that's like asking if you want McDonald's to keep putting ammonia in your hamburger. Real thing. But the NEAR Act changes what the idea of policing is, like how McDonald's has officially changed what a burger and the meaning of food is. The NEAR Act is a true reform to the idea of policing that works from the outside to maybe change the internals of a broken system, while McDonald's will continue to break you from the inside out. And realistically, thanks to the NEAR Act, who knows their community better than those that are living in it? The NEAR Act would also address the idea that we can probably stop crime. Right? Not just predict it, but look at the causes of it and try to fix those problems. Violence is really a public health issue. And just like the same way we can solve any disease by looking at what are the enzymes and the like that are at the basis of it and figure out how to counteract them, we can look at what causes quote unquote crime, especially violent crime, and get in front of the problem by dealing with the situations and the social context that led people to making certain uh, uh, choices. So we're right, this is from poverty pressures from hypergendered situations, the importance of basic needs and income can all be addressed as a group. Well, what does it mean to have a world where first and foremost, every person has what they need and to some degree based on what we can produce, what they want, right? How do we reduce the need of people to feel like they need to victimize others to survive? What is and now there will also be an armed community self-defense group to protect people from the three to 4,000 bigoted right-wing militias that politicians seem to be supporting because we haven't stopped all crimes yet. I mentioned the Huey B. Newton Gun Club, which is a relatively small group of people focused on community empowerment, and they're treated as a terrorist organization, where in Oregon you have three, 4,000 strong militias where they have state senators that are affiliated with them, and it's not considered controversial. So I think that's the context we have to consider uh, community self-defense in. Uh, it's the context of a real threat to a lot of communities, but I think it's also a context that, you know, in that context, gun ownership is very different. And it's it's part of a disciplined, organized, political, conscious movement that is very different than what we see, which is, I think, a very willy-nilly approach to either people who live on the suburbs who just are racist and fear robberies and who own guns, or people in many of our oppressed communities who feel the need to own a gun to either stay safe or to conduct their business. And a lot of those nuances have to be dealt with, I think, outside of the context of gun control. If we look at the police as a force that is in place by elites suffering from PTSD, we can let them take a little bit of a break to recover. 
right? Communities can make better decisions for themselves instead of out of touch rich people that are not vested in our communities or our people. Right? These reforms are, are, are more work on our part, but it's worth it. And we can do it as long as we help each other instead of being convinced that we constantly have to be at war amongst each other. Community paralegals and community policing are revolutionary ideas, but not entirely new. Right With the rise of the Me Too movement, we see how people are pushing the shift of the idea of the law. And the fact that the prison industrial complex is starting to be taken down little by little thanks to prison strikes, there is a new form of justice that is being enacted alongside all of these things. These are the social prisons that we are seeing now set in motion by a lot of these recent movements. To explain what I mean, let's look at what happened to Louis C.K. over the summer. To get refreshed, Louis C.K. was the center point of controversy last November when it was revealed that he had masturbated to completion, super gross phrase, uh, in front of various women. In August, it was revealed that he made a surprise appearance to the comedy cellar in New York City, and then the internet exploded. Now, uh, the issue that a lot of people had with this, that it was only nine months since this scandal was broken by the Me Too movement. And there are some people calling on him to never perform again. And there are even some people saying that what he did was the equivalent of rape and that when it comes to these sort of allegations, there are no gray areas. That is troubling. If we are to say there are no gray areas when it comes to sexual assault and rape, we are also giving a wide open claim to law enforcement and the powers that be to take away degrees of crime in the current prison system. So basically what we're saying is that it's okay to have a weed smoker be in prison for the same amount of time as a murderer. No gray areas, right? I mean, if we don't find a way to figure out how to make these social prisons work, this idea could be co-opted by the corporate prison industrial complex and used against us to put us all in prisons. The idea of the social prison is pretty new, so the rules aren't totally set, but they need to be. The question that needs to be answered is how long are these people who broke these social contracts supposed to be ostracized? And what about the idea of redemption? It's much like the an actual prison system, it seems like the social prisons need some reforming and organizing. The idea of the social prison is driven by anger, and I get it. In a lot of cases, you know, the, uh, the, of these sexual assault cases, the justice system has failed its people. And in some cases, what they do isn't punishable by the law. So we turn to these social prisons using call-outs and shame. But shame doesn't work when you say the human being is wrong rather than the actions. Driven by shame, we push people like Louis C.K. inward and towards other people that are only going to validate each other's behavior. Instead, I say, let's look at what we want to do with the real prison system and rehabilitate. If we teach these people a little bit more compassion and a little bit more empathy, right, and show these people that have shown remorse for their misgivings, that they can be better, maybe we can start reducing the number of sexual assaults. Louis C.K. apologized, and since his performance at the Comedy Cellar hasn't resurfaced, at least at the time that I'm filming this video, he hasn't. Right? But guys like Bill Cosby and Brett Kavanaugh don't seem to have any remorse for what they've done. Cosby was laughing during his arrest, and Kavanaugh proved himself to be unstable and not fit for the job of being a Supreme Court judge. Right? I, I, I feel like I feel like he's going to call Ruth Bader Ginsburg a bitch for disagreeing with him, and then he's going to flip a table because he has anger management problems, right? And I'm sure there will be some men out there that consider this to be like a true sign of leadership instead of someone whose spouse probably doesn't want to touch them. Just like those in the APAC system, people that are remorseful and are looking for redemption shouldn't be defined by their crimes, right? Look, we've all done stupid things as kids, right? I mean, I myself 
have set fire to and melted several of not just my toys, but also my sister's. And if I was defined by that forever, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do a lot of the things that I'm proud and excited about. All this proves is that we're not mature enough as a society to accept apologies and encourage with positive reinforcement. Think about that one family member, you know, that uh, locks into that one goofy thing that you did when you were a child, right? And, it, and you're sitting around at Thanksgiving and you're talking about all your accomplishments for the year and they come out of the woodwork and remind everybody that you wore whitey tighties till you were 14, right? It's a real SMH moment. That, that's shake my head for the older cats out there. It's a hard task to forgive, but if someone like Louis C.K. has shown remorse and are ready to work on themselves as a human being, then I think we should be able to try to offer them a second chance. What we need to do is decide how long they need to stay in this social prison and allow them to find a way to talk about their transgressions when they come out, if they're willing to see their mistake and work on themselves, then I think society should help them out. And yeah, sure, nine months after your controversy is a bit too soon. You know, I, I, I think he came a little too soon there. But these social prisons can be a powerful tool in today's world where there is a lack of trust in the justice system and even less trust in each other. Like how the community paralegals can help us fight back against corporate exploitation of the legal system, social prisons can help us fight back against the exploitation of people by people. And how community policing can help us reduce the violence from law enforcement, social prisons can help us reduce the violence of people by people. So all they really need is a community to be built around them to help them figure out what they're all about. As much as we champion for the disenfranchised, we can't forget about those that need help fitting into a changing world or a world that is different than what they remember it. We can do that by reinforcing the ideas of compassion, empathy, and redemption to rehumanize those that we've forgotten were human. We, we can use the community at large to push the law and those that are supposed to enforce those laws towards a direction of protecting the people and the planet. We can build a community and a society where we are constantly learning and building instead of saying that there is only one way to do the right thing, right? There are several, and it is going to take all of us working together to try all of these options. And if we don't, then we might wind up in a society that imprisons us all. That has been your forkful of noodles for this week. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the, the episode. Uh, we've got a lot more coming up in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but if you would like to support Forkful of Noodles, uh, this is what I do full time. I uh, uh, tour with comedy. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian that tours full-time, and I create comedy content full-time. If you would like to support these things, please donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, all of that starts at $2 a month. All of my stuff is going to be available for free. There's very little that's going to be behind a paywall, but if you would like to show appreciation and financially support this show, because uh, it's a lot of work to produce a show like this every single week, uh, you can donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, if you can't support this show financially, I completely understand. Uh, but a great way to help this show is by sharing. Share it with some friends. Share it with some enemies. Share it with anybody you think would enjoy content like this. Uh, and if you would like to, uh, you can follow me. You can like my Facebook page. You can give this video a thumbs up. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at KrishMohanHaha. Uh, and you can check out my website, RamenNoodlesComedy.com. We've got lots more Forkful of Noodles coming up. I'm very excited to be back. Like I said, if you want to support this show, share the hell out of it. Give it a like. Uh, and donate to the Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, check out all of the links below. Sign up for the email list to get updates uh, every single week or every single month to find out what's going on with me. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for supporting and sharing. 
uh, to all of the people that are already patrons. Thank you guys so much for, for donating. Uh, it, it means a lot. Every little bit helps. And if you want to come see me perform live stand-up comedy, I am going to be on tour through the South coming up this winter. I will be in Williamsburg, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. I'm coming back to Greensboro, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Augusta, Georgia, uh, and so many more places, Chattanooga, Tennessee, I'm all over the place, you guys, I am very excited to be back on tour uh, pretty regularly, uh, and uh, I'm also going to uh, be uh, recording my newest hour of stand-up comedy, it's called Empathy on Sale, next year, uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that date uh but if you want to keep up with uh all of my stuff and all of my tour dates you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.com that's r a m a n noodlescomedy.com uh come on out come check out a live show uh come hang out we usually uh you know have drinks after the show and get caught up and hang out and talk about weird esoteric shit so uh it's a good time so if you're if you're in the cities that I'm coming to uh and you enjoy enjoy my stuff, come out, come hang out, come say hi. It's always, uh, it's always great to, to meet people that watch the videos. Uh, so ramennoodlescomedy.com for all of my tour dates and all of my stand-up comedy albums there as well. Uh, thanks for getting into it, and we'll see you on the road.